in this time, the way we meditated on this lovely piece of music. Amen. <clears throat> so our text today asks the question, who was Jesus? His identity, his ID. It's a very important question, of course, because 2,000 years of Christianity rise and fall on the answer to that question, uh, which may not surprise you, but you can't say that about any other religion with the possible exception of Buddhism. Uh, a Muslim would not say it about Muhammad because the heart of Islam is the Quran. Uh, Muhammad's merely the prophet, the channel of the teaching. Jewish people uh, are a people of a book, uh, as we are, but the, the heart of Judaism isn't the Old Testament or Abraham or Moses, uh, not at all. It's, it's the teachings that come down through hundreds of rabbis since the Hebrew Testament was set down. A Confucian would not say that Confucius is the center of Confucian Confucianism, easy for me to say, either. But the person Jesus, uh, uh, as well as his teachings, is at the heart of our faith. So, so who is he? When uh, he came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, uh, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And, and they say, uh, well, some say John the Baptist. Uh, Herod cut off his head, but, but people think you're a lot like him because you, you both speak of the coming of God's kingdom. Others say Elijah because uh, he went away in a fiery chariot and didn't die, so, so people have been waiting for his return forever. Still others say you're, you're like Jeremiah because like you, he, he was liable to say anything at all. And, and then he says to them, enough hearsay. Now who do, you, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. Uh, and, and there is a huge difference between Matthew's version of this story of Jesus interrogating his disciples at Caesarea Philippi uh, and the other gospels. In, in Mark and Luke's version, it's pretty straightforward. Who do people say that I am? Who do you say? But here, only here in Matthew does Jesus make, make Peter the Pope and hand him the keys to the kingdom. Uh, but that is the nature of, of Matthew's gospel. It's very institutionally focused. It's all about founding the church on something solid. Uh, and much that's here, the Catholic Church would, in a few hundred years from the time the story came down, they would seize it as its own. So, in fact, the, the reason Matthew's gospel is first and not Mark's, which was clearly written before Matthew, is because Matthew's the church's gospel. Establishing the church on firm, unshakable ground was at the top of the author of this gospel's agenda, and he pushed it and wasn't above tweaking the stories of Jesus to establish the church in a steady manner. All the gospel writers, you know, of course, pushed their own agendas as well. My sense, however, uh, is that this actual story, uh, the actual story, I should say, behind this morning's text probably played out a bit differently. Here's my idea. Jesus was out on a walk with his fellows and quizzed them about his reputation. They went over what the common folk thought of him. Then they went over what the disciples thought of him. And then I imagine Jesus said, Okay, for now, let's just keep walking. Why does that make special sense to me? Because I think it's clear from everything else that we know about Jesus that uh, he didn't like being pinned down by any one stereotype, any one cliche, any one name. He had a very unique, deeply felt sense of himself. Don't we all? Now, I've been watching the popular Netflix series about the college football coach, uh, Urban Meyer, uh, and his relationships with the young, young men who played under him. And one of them was the, the notable quarterback, Tim Tebow. Now, Tebow is a great storyteller. He comes across in this doc as a, as a very humble Christian. And in this age of, you know, hyper-aggressive, over-testosteroned, 
male-dominated fundamentalism. He comes across in the documentary as an old-school, mild-mannered gentleman. At one point, he, he tells his own Genesis story. He says, I wasn't supposed to be born. There were all these problems with the pregnancy. He spoke of how doctors predicted that he wasn't likely to survive the birth and his mother's life was in big danger too. In any case, she gave birth and the baby Tim was fine. And then he said, from his earliest recollection, he was told by all his family members, older brothers, sisters, dad, mom, that he was a special child, a miracle, in fact, that it was clear God had a special plan for him, that he was bound to do, quote, awesome, great things. Tim Tebow said, you know what happens when you're told that over and over and over again? You believe it. <laughs> I wonder if Jesus had a sense of himself that was something like that. One wonders, I mean, you know, he was a Palestinian peasant, not an American. He was born in a tiny backwater town, but still there is no doubt he was something beyond remarkable, and he knew it. One thing we can say about Jesus with, without stereotyping him is that he was a spiritual genius. We know this because there's no doubt that he had this incredible following. He was someone who, if he touched you, you would never forget it. As a result, things happened inside people that healed things in them or changed them forever. I mean, if that wasn't true to some degree, he, he would have disappeared from history, along with the millions of other remarkable religious people who were just not remarkable enough to speak to generation after generation that followed. He spoke like no one else of his day, and there were, were notable speakers in his day. Palestine was full of them. His prayer life, his prayer life was rich. He he was prone to visions, and he filled people around him with awe. That's what the gospel writer Mark says. Because of his energy, his common sense, and because of what they saw in his eyes, we'd say he had charisma. You remember the film, A Beautiful Mind? A movie about the Nobel-winning mathematician John Forbes Nash? played so remarkably by Russell Crowe. Allow me to quote a little bit from the book that that movie was based on. Geniuses, the mathematician Paul Halmos wrote, are of two kinds. The ones who are just like all of us, but very much more so, and the ones who apparently have an extra human spark. We can all run, and some of us can run a mile in less than four minutes. But there's nothing that most of us can do that compares with the creation of Bach's G minor fugue. The genius of John Nash was of that mysterious variety, more often associated with music and art than with the oldest of all sciences, the science of mathematics. It wasn't merely that his mind worked faster, that his memory was more retentive, or that his powers of concentration were greater. The flashes of intuition he had were non-rational. Like other great mathematical intuitionists, John Nash saw the vision first, constructing the laborious proofs long afterward. But even after he'd tried to explain some astonishing result, the actual route he had taken had remained a total mystery to others who tried to follow his reasoning. Donald Newman, I'm still quoting here, Donald Newman, a mathematician who knew Nash at MIT in the 1950s, used to say about him that, quote, everyone else would climb a peak by looking for a path somewhere on the mountain. Nash would climb another mountain altogether, and from that distant peak would shine a searchlight back onto the first peak. Think of that. That was the order of genius that people beheld in Jesus. 
You know, he never said, worship me. He said, follow me. And there is a world of difference between the two and how you understand life and how it unfolds. And we are here today because a critical mass of men and women followed him. They, they couldn't help themselves. One reason was because he was always a step ahead of them and their puny ways of thinking about spiritual matters. He knew how they, they tended to believe the conventional wisdom of the day like we all do. You know, that if people were sick or poor, it was their own damn fault. He knew how they, they tended, that's, that's, you know, Fox News wisdom right there. He knew how they tended to believe the rabbis of the day who said that the rich and wealthy among them must be very righteous in the eyes of God because God clearly rewards the righteous with health and wealth. That's what the rabbis said. But Jesus saw through this phony nonsense. One day he spoke to his followers. This is in the gospel. One, of, one day he spoke to his followers about a recent news headline. He said, remember that tower at the little town of Siloam that fell over and those 18 people were killed? Do you suppose they were any more sinful than any other group of 18 people you could assemble randomly? Of course not. He was appealing to their common sense. No one else did that. They would have said those 18 people were bad. Come on, come on. Then he appealed to their understanding of nature. He took them out to look at the fields of local farmers. A steady rain was falling. He pointed out the fields of four or five farmers that they knew really well. And then he said, look there, look, look. Not just with your eyes, but with your heart. The rain is falling today on the farms of the just and the unjust alike. God blesses them all equally. The nourishing rain every farmer needs falls on the farm of the guy they know is a kind of saint. It's good to his wife and kids. And also on the crops of the one they know is a total shyster. It's a crapshoot, this life. And he knew it. It's all the same. Jesus had seen things in plain sight that the rabbis totally missed or dismissed. Now, that's not just a demonstration of his special wisdom. Jesus was after higher stakes than being a, a fancy moral philosopher. He wanted to free a whole generation of people who were sick or desperately poor and who were trapped by a very cruel philosophy that made religious people look down their noses at them and blame them because of their, their misfortune. He also wanted to free God, who he knew as benevolent, from a very puny theology, one that made God nothing but an evil puppet master. No, said Jesus, life is so much more complex and beautiful than you can even imagine. Let me tell you how. Consider the lilies. It's just that about Jesus that makes me a Christian and that keeps me motivated many years along in this preaching profession way past the time uh, I could have retired. When people say, oh yeah, Jesus was, you know, a great teacher, I think, no, uh, there's more than that here. In him, I truly believe I see the beating heart of God, vulnerable, all loving, infinitely beautiful. So, you know, it's not enough to say, I believe in God, that's fine. A growing number of Christians hate other people in the name of the God they believe in. Some of those people kill people in the name of God, the God they believe in. People legitimize their prejudices every day in the name of God, the Christian God. We see this all the time. Jesus had no use for this. He bet his life that God was not someone who would ask people to hate or kill in God's name. Just the opposite. There is just some kind of truth that is positively deep and abiding that happens when this 
first century Palestinian peasant named Jesus chose to hang out with women who were not in his family, which was against the religious law, talk to them, hear them out, invite them to follow him. It was, can I use the word saving? Because it saved them from being only half or less of what they were meant to be. And look, he was just warming up with that. He triumphed in another area as well. When he chose to invite children, uh, boy and girl children, to climb onto his lap and ask him questions and bless their little heads, like they were real people, you know. Because in the first century, a parent might not even choose to name a child until it was five or six. They were hardly considered human. By honoring women and children, Jesus was 2,000 freaking years ahead of his time. And when you think about it, it's rather unbelievable. I mean, his example is unprecedented in history. It is a God thing. You want to know what God is like, asked Jesus. God, God does things like bless little children. With the women's movement now only 50 years old, really, and the fact that we, we now value and respect children as never before, we're, we're all in touch, I think, finally with what Jesus was pointing at so long ago. It only has taken 2,000 years for us to catch on to what he was about. And a lot of people who follow him haven't a clue about either of those things. So that's why we're here today trying to say that very thing that is screaming to be said. So please forgive my sarcasm, but it is no exaggeration to say that it has taken 2,000 years for the world to even begin to understand what he was about. And that's a measure of how in touch with God he was. What is God like, we ask? One day his disciples were arguing about, uh, uh, about you know, who among them was, was disciple number one. You know, these are the people that followed him. They were just like you and me. And Jesus took a bowl of water and a towel and wordlessly began washing their feet. Without a word, he was demonstrating what God was like. The wonderful Jesus scholar I was honored to know, Marcus Borg, asked himself Peter's question. Who do you say the Son of Man is? And he answered with this short sentence. Jesus is the decisive disclosure of the character and passion of God. Jesus is the decisive disclosure of the character and passion of God. When people come to join this church, they're asked this following question. Do you find the life and teachings of Jesus to be an inspiration and a reminder that we live out of purposes larger than ourselves? Do you find the life and teachings of Jesus to be an inspiration and a reminder that we lit out, live out of purposes larger than ourselves? To answer that in the affirmative is to say that you are willing to set your course to explore in an intentionally safe community like this one all the ways his words and his person can save us from insidious ways of thinking and being, puny ways of thinking and being that keep us from becoming all that God made us to be now and forever. This is more important than anything I've said so far. Franz Kafka, a writer I just marvel over. Amazing, mystical Jewish genius from Prague. Was once interviewed. The text of that interview appeared long after his death in Partisan Review in 1953. The interviewer asked Kafka the question that Peter answered. Who is Jesus for you? 
And Kafka answered it this way, and it's the best definition of Jesus I have ever heard. He said, Jesus is an abyss filled with light. One must close one eye, one's eyes if one is not to fall into it. Amen. Please stand and join.